Do you ever plan events in Salt Lake City? Whether it's a meeting, a fundraiser, or a party, you should add The Shop to your venue list. The Shop on 400 South can handle groups of any size. The third floor event space has cozy nooks so you won't need staging furniture. And the rooftop patio offers city views for sunset cocktails. You can book one or both of these spaces together. Learn more and take a virtual tour at shopworkspace.com. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. There's a nip in the air and Trader Joe's is selling mutant squash. It's leaf peeping season. The debate about whether or not to gatekeep our favorite nature spots is always hot in this city. We hashed it out last spring. So here are a few things to mull over as you prepare for fall's outdoor adventures. Or just a roadside Christian girl autumn photo shoot. It's Thursday, September 14th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Madeline McGill, you are the founder of Western Desk, a communications firm that focuses on rural storytelling. You also founded the Hey Salt Lake newsletter back in the day. New listeners might not know. It's great to have you back. It is so good to be back. Well, you and I are here to chew on the practice of gatekeeping outdoor spaces because it is <laughs> not to be ironic, but like kind of a Salt Lake rite of passage to decide whether or not to share coordinates to your favorite spot. Absolutely. But I want to start by like kind of defining the terms. Do we need to ditch the word gatekeeping? Or is there a way to reframe it? Because I feel like it turns people off. What a word, gatekeeping, right? Mm. It implies so much. There's power, there's opportunities, there's resources. But I think that we kind of need to step back a little bit from the language that implies so much infringement and muzzling and look more at gatekeeping as limiting information, <laughs> which isn't always a bad thing, right? But comes with such high consequences. I think that gatekeeping can be reframed sometimes as an ethic, right? This literal concept of the gates that we keep in public lands. For those of you that have traveled in Southern Utah, you might pass a cow gate, right? Or like be trying to access your favorite trail and uh, see something that's closed, but always close the gate behind you isn't an instruction to keep people out. It doesn't mean go act, don't access your trail. It just means move through the outdoors in a way that is respectful to those who came before and also to people that are using these spaces as working lands. So if that's gatekeeping, then let's go. But the word itself implies such a negative connotation when used in silo. Well, when we think about this practice of holding spaces that we love close to our chest, in what ways do we see it doing harm? Oh, man. All of us in Utah have this beautiful landscape at our doorsteps and therefore often have a deep commitment and a love of place. But what we see often, right, are that we live also in this fragile ecosystem. And as we start to access these places more and more, we're creating an undue burden and strain on locals and agencies and ourselves who are grappling with the consequences of loving some of these places to death. Yeah. Can you give me an example of something that we've loved to death, either in like Southern Utah or even just in Salt Lake County? Okay. So I think there's there's some fun examples, right? I like to think of dogs in Salt Lake County. And do you know oh. how if you have a dog, there's only like three watering holes <laughs> in the city, yeah. right? There's City Creek. There's City Creek. There's Tanner. There's Tanner. <laughs> yes. And then there's Mill Creek Canyon yes. on odd days. And there's that they can one be pond in Sugar House, right? And so <laughs> you find two things. Everyone who has a dog is going to the same four places in Salt Lake. And suddenly any riparian quarter on those beautiful little water zones is completely trampled. The mud is yeah. full of giardia. All of our dogs are getting sick. I mean, like we see concentrated impact within the city in a million different ways. But then also we look at the way that much loved public lands in southern Utah, like Arches and Zion, are crafting very specific management plans to monitor and also change the way that people access them. Whether it's buses, whether if it's a reservation system, uh, we are seeing an increase in visitation over the last five years, like nothing our state has ever experienced. And as a result... Yeah. People are taking and agencies are taking tangible action to change how we might get to arches or how we might get to the narrows. 
And some people aren't happy. (laughs) But we have to think about, you know, action versus consequences. And at a certain point, like one of the things that it feels like, especially locals in this state are grappling with is like taking a bus up Zion National Park or having to like get a permit to go on a hike. Like, I think a lot of us see these as consequences to the growing popularity of these spaces. Like our view of them is that they are us being punished for the word getting out about these places. But there is sort of an inevitability to them, right? Yeah, I think that brings up an important point, actually, which is denying versus protecting, right? So Mm. Zion and other landscapes, be they wilderness study areas, are often sensitive places, right? And sometimes sacred. And when we think about gatekeeping the outdoors, we have to understand the difference between protecting these spaces and denying people access, which is important when Mm. folks get upset, right, about some places being more difficult to get to. But... I think about other landscapes in the West, right, like Devil's Tower. We close it in June for indigenous ceremony. Or for those of you that climb in the creek, right, we try to not climb certain routes during particular nesting seasons. We have these places that we try to monitor impact, and the way that we move through them is so intricate and interconnected, it may make it more difficult for us to access them. And yes, that may make us upset, but also we all have a role in protecting them. And sometimes that role is to not go. Yeah. But who writes the rules? Yes. Okay. I think that's <laughs> that's the real problem, right? It's not protecting landscapes that I think we disagree on. It's who's writing the rules of who can go and who can not go. Especially when we live in a landscape, right, which is so defined by the ethics of uh, white men who were able to write about them first <laughs> and so mm-hmm. defined by this like post-colonial scarcity around what it means to occupy public lands. I think that things like accessibility and diversity and ecosystem and indigenous perspective were not necessarily the uh, front of mind for authors. I'll say it like Ed Abbey, who has an incredible history of (laughs) thinking and writing around gatekeeping. Okay. If you're going to subtweet Ed Abbey, you have to define who he is for anyone who's new to Utah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So Ed Abbey was a ranger in Arches National Park. I mean, he was a lot of things, but Mm -hmm. his, (laughs) some of his nominal works included describing arches before it was paved and talking about how it should in some ways remain inaccessible uh, by not installing roads, by not paving access. But what we might ask at Abbey now in a modern context is, my dude, have you ever thought about what it might take to get your grandmother to arches, to delicate arch? Right. Like, what about accessing the, accessing the national parks in a wheelchair? Like, paving right. roads into the park in some ways made them more accessible to all in a way that I think we couldn't imagine even 50 years ago. Well, and beyond just like the nuts and bolts of physical accessibility, there is an existential accessibility that we talk about when we talk about the outdoors, right? Like we know that 2% of visitors to national parks identify as Black or Mm African-American. We all have to take responsibility for that. And it's a really good point. I think we've talked about, you know, why we might gatekeep, but when we think about why we shouldn't gatekeep, We think about the folks who, right, first designated public lands in the United States, and we think about how the should-bes of access are often written by people that already have access to those spaces, who are lucky enough to be integrated into a life of the outdoors. Gatekeeping, right, contributes to this desire to keep public lands in the purview of those people, often wealthy enthusiasts, often white and can be perceived as a way of like monitoring each other's behavior and participating in a system whereby black people and indigenous people get over-policed. Uh, and even though they often, as you mentioned, are not folks that are accessing those spaces in the first place and could be. Mm. It can be, I think, a difficult pill for people to swallow who think that these spaces not belong to them, but are sacred to them, right? These like special quiet places. But the hard pill to swallow often is that we need people in the outdoors, right? We need greater accessibility. Mm. I think about, do you mind if I riff for a second on this? Send it. Public lands aren't just spaces where people walk and play, right? For many places, in many spaces, it's where people work. And when we think about working lands, Mm. we need more eyes on acres. We need more people caring about these places, understanding what it takes to preserve an ecosystem. And Bringing people into that space is how we get them to love it and how we get them to care for it. And the same Mm. goes, right, for a lot of public lands and advocacy in Utah. 
if the hard thing is that if we're not there as advocates, there's often an extractive industry that is there without us, right? Be it oil drilling, be it mineral extraction, be it <laughs> uh, many of the industries that are siphoning away our water. We have to be there and we have to love them and we have to understand what it takes to love them. And that includes creating accessibility, letting folks in and making sure that these spaces are equitable and accessible and represent the diversity of the people that make up our state. <laughs> and if that means like busting right. down the doors of the gatekeeping culture, then we got to find out a way to do it. And we have to find a way to do it sustainably. Hey, Salt Lake, it's Emily. You know we're all about celebrating local at CityCast Salt Lake. So we like highlighting businesses that are on the same wavelength as us. Like Harmon's Grocery. They love offering as many local choices as they can. From farmers, to cottage artisans, to community craftsmen. They put a lot of effort into stocking their stores with items from Utah-based businesses. We are talking more than 5,000 local items on their shelves. For me, it's about the cheese, chocolate, and produce. I love picking up a wedge of beehive cheddar, a ritual chocolate bar, fresh fruit from local farmers. And look at that. With one trip to Harmon's, you've got yourself a little local snack board for your next girl dinner. Harmon's believes the more we all support our neighbors who run local businesses, the better it is for all of us. Shop for local items at your local Harmon's. Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep, it's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah, I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. What is the role of social media in all of this? Because like on the one hand, when you geotag a place, you are opening up the floodgates of visitorship. I think a lot about the monolith. So for anyone who wasn't here, basically overnight in southeastern Utah, this metal obelisk sort of appeared <laughs> in the desert. And we all learned about it through social media that it suddenly existed and no one could figure out who built it or who put it there, but it drove massive visitorship. And what quickly happened is lines and lines of people visiting the monolith, the like land management organizations begging people to like pick up poop, like pick up trash. Like we just saw the area become overrun mm -hmm. and the monolith kind of disappeared overnight. And this feels like the full arc of what happens when these places get exposed without any sort of regulation or any sort of rulemaking. I mean, here's the thing. We live on Mars in Utah. Everything in this state is beautiful and strange, difficult to access. And when you stumble upon it, sometimes it feels like you're the first person that's ever seen it and that aliens put it on the earth. <laughs> um, yeah. The experience of the monolith for us, I think, is what it's like for many people who have never been here to go to Goblin Valley for the first time. And the lesson for me around the monolith is it's about resources. Like if we're going to have places that are suddenly quote unquote discovered by social media or suddenly exposed by geotagging, the impacts are tangible and immediate and that we have to A, trust our agencies and start providing more resources to monitor those impacts and to measure and also manage them. So for those of you like me that are participating in loving Southern Utah to death, paying closer attention to the management plans that are being drafted for our national monuments, the travel plans that are being created for our national parks, state park designation versus national park, and what that means for how many people work there. Right. The lesson of the monolith isn't to blame each other. It's to figure out how to resource institutions that can implement policies that allow us all to enjoy the monolith. And it's wonder. And it's bizarre, whatever bizarre joy it brought us. The such bizarre joy. Yeah. Well, the other thing about social media is that, I mean, a question I have is, does it disrupt 
the power of local people to manage their own resources and be the wisdom holders and be the tour guides of their own community, right? Like I think about people arriving into Salt Lake and visiting Mill Creek Canyon and being greeted by someone, a gatekeeper, right? Mm -hmm. Like a employee of the state or the county who is at the bottom of the canyon sharing information as opposed to arriving to a space with information that they've gleaned from a blog or from an Instagram post and taking their experience into their own hands in that way. And then we're putting a lot of strain on our local agencies and also local search and rescue, which is often personed by locals, by people seeing something beautiful on the internet and trying to get there without any resources or any question or any understanding of the space. Uh, And I'm not saying that's all of us, right? But you do it enough times and it puts a lot of strain on, let's say, Garfield County Search and Rescue. And before you know it, Peekaboo Canyon. Peekaboo Spooky. Yeah, our slot canyons. Search and Rescue folks are exhausted by you getting stuck in Peekaboo and Spooky Canyon. I'm so sorry. (laughs) By me getting stuck, I'll say. And we have to understand that someone accessing that space and being unsafe, burning out, local people and local agencies makes it harder for them to get to you the next time that someone's leg is broken in the same canyon. Um, These local economies are so delicate and people care a lot and we want to support each other. And we also, we all want to get to that place, right? We want to see the view. We want to love the landscape. But if we could look at our collective behavior from a 10,000 foot view and understand the impact that we're having, not just on the landscape, but on each other and on locals. There's no evil tourist, right? There's no like vilifying the person that wants to get to Peekaboo Spooky. I wish we were in a space where we could ask each other more questions instead of using Instagram as a resource before we go. I mean, I think there's no answer. Like you and I don't have the answer. There is This no conversation answer. doesn't end with you or I being like, so it's this, 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 and this. Yeah. And that is the reason that like you look on any comments section on any Salt Lake post yeah. and you're going to find this conversation. Like it's a tangled web, but we have to be asking these questions. I mean- We are in a moment right now where we have our first ever indigenous secretary of the interior. God bless. Right? So before now, these institutions weren't even being run with any input of indigenous wisdom or by indigenous people. So we're experiencing this dramatic shift right now. It's happening right now around us. And that is one of the things that makes living in the West so momentous right now. And so we don't have the answers. But I do have a little bit of faith that we're getting to a place where we're going to see better and more thoughtful conversations about quote unquote secret spaces that come from a place of and acknowledge that there is no such thing as secret spaces. I guess final thoughts are the people that have proclaimed to be experts in these spaces are being dismantled, right? They're being taken off of their pedestals. And we have this hopeful new world where we get to think about ecology and local economies and diversity in the outdoors and not just conservation and preservation. And that, that's an opportunity, but we have to harness it, right? We have to grab the reins. We have to consider perspectives that we might not otherwise have sought out even a few years ago. And I just hope we can all go gently and go carefully Mm. and not police each other, right? Like this isn't, locals versus tourists. This isn't agencies versus whatever. This isn't, you know, scientists versus residents. It's just all of us. Mm -hmm. And we're all going to feel the impacts if we don't manage it well. Madeline McGill, founder of Western Desk. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good to be back. (laughs) One more thing before we go, and it's a fall PSA from me. The kokanee salmon are running. They use every ounce of their remaining life to boost upstream and lay eggs before dying. And their final triumph is to turn a gorgeous deep red. You can watch the salmon run at Kazi Reservoir, Strawberry Reservoir, and a handful of other local water bodies. It's a fantastic natural phenomenon and a good excuse to stretch your legs. I've got a full list of locations and tips from the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources for you. It's linked in the show notes. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. 
Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.